Shalom, family. Welcome to another edition of Maccabees TV. And I'm here, once again, by popular demand, with my brother, Yeshu Zafran, historian, Yenite, a.k.a. Maria Yeshaya Yisrael. How you doing? Shalom. All right, all right, all right. So, look. I'm here, man, because you have a lot of information you want to bring out, and it's been a while since we filmed. So um, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready, brother, just uh, address what it is you want to address. Giving honor and praise unto Yah, the creator and the maker of heaven and earth. We want to sit there and first touch upon two not-so-big subjects, but just to get certain things out the way first. Um, The whole big thing with Messianic and non-Messianic, very, very brief. Um, the understanding, the concept of there being a Messiah is a concept that comes out of Exodus chapter 28, which is in which we'll call the Old Testament, the second book of the Torah. So that's something to be noted and understood. So it's never um, a good thing for Israel to debate between who they say the Mashiach or who the Messiah is. Because if you notice, that brought more problems in the ancient days. You know, um, people saying it was Saul, some people saying it was David, some people saying it was Northern Kingdom, some people saying it was the Southern Kingdom. And so if you understand ancient Israelite history properly, there were two Messiah ships. There was the line of the priests and then of the Levites that had the high priest line. And then you read about their names chronological order when you go to First Chronicles chapter 6. Then there's the line that come out of the kings from David on down and so forth and so on. So that's just something we pointed out too. Mind you, the King Yehu that we spoke of last time, he too was a Messiah because he was anointed. So was Aaron, so was Eleazar, so was Itamar, so was Nadab and Abihu, so was David, so was Solomon, so was Saul. You understand? So was Aaron. So these certain things have to be noted and understood, all right, for edification purposes. Another issue is the definition, brothers and sisters, of the word Japheth. The word Japheth in Hebrew is the word Yafeth. You understand? It is spelled with the Hebrew letters Yod, Fe, and Thou. Or if you're coming from the Lachron Kwadash understanding, the Hebrew letters Ya, Pa, and Ta, or Ya, Pa, and Tha. You understand? So let that be noted and understood. The root of that linguistically takes you back to the Hebrew root word Pata. The Hebrew word Pata means to entice or to deceive. This is the same word that you see in Ezekiel 14, verse 9. This is the same Hebrew word that you see when you go to the book of Exodus, chapter 22 or chapter 21, where it says if a man entices a maid, that's not betrothed. That's the same root word there. So when we go to Genesis chapter 9, 27, the mistranslation in the Masoretic text and in the King James, mind you, where it says, um, may God enlarge Japhet. The Hebrew root word there is not to enlarge. It's the Hebrew root word, Yaft Elohim Le'yafet. In Genesis 9, 27, may God entice Japhet, why Yishkon Ba'ahale Shem, and may he dwell in the tent of Shem. So that's something to be noted. And understood. So it's not talking about Japheth being enlarged because of all the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The smallest is actually Japheth. You understand? Because Japheth had 14 seeds, and then Shem had 30, 26, and then Ham had 30. So 30 from Ham, 26 from Shem, and 40 from and 14, that is to say, from Japheth, gives you 70. 14, 26, and 30 gives you 70. Those are the 70 nations. Okay, so that way to be noted and understood in history. All right, just want to sit there and let that be noted for edification purposes. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the Hebrew. Because there's some um, weird concepts and understandings that has come from some people. They want to say, brothers and sisters, that the Hebrew word zak, which is spelt with the letter zade and the letter ket. You see this in the book of Psalms. Um, pardon me, you see this in the book of Psalms of Solomon. Chapter 5, verse 10. And you see this in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4. And they attempt to state that the word Zak means white. And then try to sit there and state that it's speaking about him being white like Caucasian. But that's not what the scriptures there is speaking of. So in speaking of this, I want to sit there and go, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4 in the English. All right, I'm going to read out of the regular King James Version and then get to the Hebrew Stone Edition so we can gain an understanding from what the scriptures Hebraically is saying. And Yeshayahu or Isaiah 32, verse 4, in the, he in the English we read, The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, 
So it's talking about the heart, the leg, the mind, all right? The heart also of the wrath shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. The vile person shall be no more called liberal, nor the troll said to be bountiful. Now, in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4, it distinctly uses the English word plainly. Okay? Now, an acronym for that is bright. An acronym for that is clear. So, those are certain things to be noted and understood. In the book of Yashayahu, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4 in the Hebrew, we see this. Ulbab mean harim yabin ladaat ul shon ilgin temahir ladabir zakot. Now, the Hebrew word that the brother is showing you and highlighting that is, is this word as we see right here, which is the last word there, which is the word zakot. The word zakot is the pluralization of the Hebrew word zak. So let that be noted and understood. For edification purposes, brothers and sisters, I like to go, if we will, to this book right here. This is called the Analytical Hebrew and Child Lexicon. Okay, so now we're going to go to page, if we will, 643. So I can sit there and show what I'm speaking about in this particular premise. 643, and here is what we see. All right, for edification purposes. We see, brothers and sisters, the Hebrew word, dakak. All right, so you can sit there and see what that's talking about. Now, for those familiar heavily with the Hebrew, you might say, wow, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Because you have, he said zak, but the lexicon had zakak. And what that does in Hebrew, that is referred to as an ayin ayin verb. Anytime a verb in Hebrew has the second and the third letter as the same letter, when you conjugate that same verb, you are actually able to drop one of them off. This happens in the Hebrew word sabab, when you go into the book of Exodus. This happens with the Hebrew word Zarar. When you go to the book of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, Sabab means to encircle. Zarar means to be adverse with or to vex. You understand? So that's something to be noted in that. Brothers and sisters, when you go and you study what is referred to as biblical Hebrew, this kind of thing will be noted and clarified and understood. So now the definition of this, it says what? To be bright, to be white. Zak, masculine, adjective, bright or white, bright, serene, metaphorically clear or plain. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4. Now, let's take some of the bootleg definitions because we know white means not the pale man that we're speaking of. Okay, so let's take the definition that some try to say that it means white and then read Isaiah 32, verse 4 again under that bootleg definition and see what we come up with. It says this under that understanding, right? The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge. Rash means what? Quickly, hastily, rashly done, sloppily, okay? And the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak white. That doesn't sound right. You understand? The Hebrew root word for white as the color is the word laban. Shakor is black, Edom is red. Kakol is blue, and Yarek is green, and Zahor is yellow. So those are just, and Tapuz is orange. So in the Hebrew that many people speak, that's how you explain what the colors are, all right, for edification purposes. Now, getting back quickly into this portion right here, not spending too much time on it, but just to let it be noted and understood, that the word Zakot is the pluralization of the word Zak. Now, when you go into part in that the cover is off. You can look the Ben Yehuda, right? English Hebrew and English Hebrew dictionary. And you look under the word Zak in this dictionary right here, right? Here is what we read for edification purposes. This is on page 256 on the Hebrew side for those who are able to see it. Okay, and this is the definition that you see that's highlighted right there, brother, right there in the yellow. See, the word white is not even dictionary orientated. It says pure, clear, and bright. So you can't sit there and then try to say that Isaiah chapter 32 verse 4 is saying that somebody is going to be speaking white. That is one of the most low down, low budget definitions that somebody can sit there and try to sit there and talk about. 
All right, so let that be noted and understood. Now, another thing to get into concerning this matter is if we go, brothers and sisters, to even the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10. And we're going to go there and break that translation down verbatim. All right? Let's be the most high. So, hope everybody's doing well. We're going to go and let the scripture speak in its um, own totality. The book of Songs of Solomon, chapter... Five, go to the King James Version first. All right. So the Solomon chapter five, verse 10. All right. So how you doing, brother? You good? Everything's good, bro. That's good. Following. All right. I was in Isaiah, sorry. It reads as follows. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as a most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. Now, they're trying to sit there and say that this is talking about he being white like a European or Caucasian and some of the bootleg definitions that they have. Mind you, the Hebrew word for white is Laban as a color. So let that be noted. We already went over Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4, where it uses the root word zak in reference about meaning pure, meaning bright, and meaning clear. So let that be noted and understood. All right? That's something to be noted. Now, in the Hebrew, in Sons of Solomon chapter 5, verse 10, we see the following. Dodi zak wa adom, gadul mirbaba, rosho ketempaz. Now, I wanted to sit there and point out a couple of things that the brother is showing you. Um, Sons of Solomon chapter 5, verse 10, only there in the Hebrew. The same root word you see there is the word dodi. That means my friend or my beloved. That comes from the Hebrew root word hadad, which means to be beloved. The same root word that Solomon's nickname was in one case where they call him yadidya, meaning beloved of the Most High. The same root word Hadad means also the root word for the name of David. When you go into the book of Numbers, it says Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Eldad means beloved of God. Okay, so Dad in Hebrew means beloved or friend. So let that be noted. So Dodi means my beloved or my friend. All right. Dodi Zak wa Adon Gadul Mir Baba. Now you already went over the word Zak. All right, as the brother is showing you right there, the word zak already is has been explained to meaning pure, meaning bright, and meaning clear. So it's not saying white. So let that be noted. Then the next word that they go over in their misunderstanding of it is the root word there, wa well, adom. Adom in Hebrew and edom is two different things. This is where we stand as far as using what they call the nikudo or the vowels as far as our point and contention with that aspect. Now, one of the things to point out is this. The word Adam, okay, let's go in linguistically in Hebrew. The word Adam means man. It means mortal. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, it says, And Yah called their name Adam in the day he created them. That is speaking about both the man and his wife. It's because Adam means human. So that's what that's talking about in that particular case. So let that be noted and understood. Secondly, when you go into the book of Ezekiel chapter one and two and three and four, he's referred to as what? Ben Adam, meaning what? Son of man. So what kind of man is the word Adam and Adom speaking of? The Hebrew root word Adam as stated means just that, man. Man is a what? Is a chief, is a head, is a lord. You understand? So that's something to be noted and understood. Now, for those who are very linguistically sound in the Hebrew, I want to sit there and get into a particular thing. After breaking this down, Dodi Zakwa Adom, Gadul. The Hebrew word Gadul means prominent. Okay? And then it says Gadur Mir Baba. Now, the root word there, Rababa, means 10,000 or a myriad. Because in Hebrew, the highest number you can get to is 10,000. This is why in Daniel 7, it says 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him and the books was open. You, there is no Hebrew word for million, there's no Hebrew word for zillion. There's no Hebrew word for quadrillion. 
the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew language, the numbers in at 10,000. Stop being quabzon. Stop being greedy when you got numbers that um, can only be transliterated into your own language. The Hebrew language, when it speaks of in Daniel 7, where it says 10,000 times 10,000, that is speaking about 100 million because there's no Hebrew word for million. So you take the 10,000 and just add on to that. Now, getting back to what we're speaking of here, it says, my friend or my beloved is bright and is a chief. He is prominent over 10,000. That's a better and more accurate Hebraic translation, not white and ruddy. So that's something just to sit there and let that to be noted and understood. All right. The Hebrew word Zak is never going to be shown and seen in reference about somebody being pale or being of a European looking, quote unquote, today's definition of a white man. Now, let's take the definition we saw in the Ben Yehuda's dictionary, right? For Zak, meaning pure, meaning bright and meaning clear. And let's take the bootleg definition that they give of Adom, meaning ruddy. Buddy, they like to sit there and tell you means, oh, it means showing redness in the face and so forth and so on, right? Um, under that definition, let's look and see what they're saying. Zak meaning bright and white, and Edom or Adom also meaning ruddy. How can you be ruddy and pure? How can you be ruddy and bright? Either you're one or the other. You can't be two different colors. Unless you are sick, heaven forbid, and there's discoloration, or heaven forbid, you um have an injury and you get a bruise. That's when you can be legally called two different colors. But you cannot take the word zak in the definitions we went over and then try to sit there and say that it's talking about that. In the book of Isaiah chapter 30, it speaks in reference about the moon and the Hebrew word that's used there is the word labana. Laban, as we know, means white. Labana also means moon because the moon is white. So that's as accurate in um, Hebraic understanding. OK, so just to sit there and let that be noted and understood. And speaking about this with some characters, individuals, they normally don't talk about Laban and they normally don't talk about what is referred to in Leviticus chapter 13. When you go to Leviticus chapter 13, if we will, we don't go to Leviticus chapter 13, verse 29 to verse 31. So we can gain an understanding of what some of the things is talking about within the Hebrew. Understanding of certain things. All right. Here is what we read. We're going to go to the King James Version first. And then read what the Hebrew says so we can gain from the Hebraic understanding of what we're talking about. In Leviticus chapter 13 verse 29. We read the following. It says this. If a man or woman have a plague upon the head or the beard, then the priest shall see the plague and behold, if it be in the sight deeper than the skin and there be in it a yellow thin hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a dry skull, even a leprosy upon the head or beard. And if the priest look upon the plague of the skull and behold, it be not in sight deeper than the skin, and that there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut him up that half the plague of the skull seven days. Now, let's go and see, brothers and sisters, with the Hebrew, particularly, we only going to read verse 30 and see what it says there, right? Here is what it says in there. And the priest, he shall see, et hanega, the plague, wahine, mar ehu, and behold, if its appearance, amok min ha or, is deeper than the skin itself. Ubo say er zohab. Now, as the brother is showing you this particular verse, we're speaking of Leviticus chapter 13, verse 30. I want to emphasize on that word, brothers and sisters, the word zohab, as we see here. The word zohab means blonde. The word zohab means yellow. If there be a thin yellow here, what does it say? Doc. What Time Otoha Kohen in the priest, he shall pronounce him, he shall proclaim him to be unclean. Netek who he is of the plague, Zara'at of leprosy. Harosh O Hazakwan who of the head or the beard is he. So that's how you linguistically break it down in Hebrew, and the Khazar Jews are not gonna go that deep. Because they do not want to sit there and show 
good and well that the word Zohab means yellow and it means blonde. All right. I have once again the Ben Yehuda's dictionary. I apologize. All right. Because of the condition of the book. What happened is I used it, put it in bags, put it on the shelf, used it, put it in the bag shelf and the cover ripped off. Okay. <clears throat> so let that be noted and understood. The Hebrew word Zohab, as we can sit there and see, literally, right here on page 255 in the Hebrew, means what? To be bright, to be yellow, to gladden, to be angry. Zohab, yellow. Zahabhab, yellowish. Zahabet, jaundice. So I just want to sit there and have that particular part right there to be shown under those who are able to see where the word Zohab in it meaning yellow. Yellow and blonde. That's one of the Europeans' delicacies as far as he is concerned. Oh, she's a blonde. She's beautiful. You know, the Pamela Anderson type of thing. The Hebrew scriptures let us know that is the plague of leprosy. That's not normal. Something is wrong. Okay, so that's something to be pointed out in that particular thing right there. Now, I want to continue on. Um... For any questions concerning what we're presenting, I have absolutely no problem to sit there and explain this. Let's go, if you will, to Lamentations chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to read in the King James Version first and then move on. Okay? Lamentations chapter 4. This is after Jeremiah because Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, mind you. All right? When um, speaking about reference about the children of Yisrael being in the land of Babylon in, in captivity. All right, Lamentations 4, 7. And here is what we read here in the English. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage is blacker than coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is with it. It has become like a stick. So this is what some other people try to sit there and go in Lamentations 4, verse 7 and 8 and sit there and say, yeah, see, it's talking about them being white and ruddy. Let's go into the Hebrew like we did before. All right, let's go. Lamentations, right? We're going to go to Lamentations chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. And we're going to see what the Hebrew says. All right, here's what we see right here. Zaku niz reha mishelek. Zaku. Mekalab Admu Etzem Mip Pinim Sapir Giz Ratam Kashak Mishkol Ta'aram Lo Nikru Bakuzot Zafad Oram Al Atmam Yabish Haya Ka'it. Now, the brother, I'm going to ask him just to show verse 7 in the Hebrew, because I read 7 and 8. But I'm going to ask him just to show verse 7 there in the Hebrew, so we can sit there and explain what this is talking about. The Hebrew root word we see verse here, Zaku, the, za, the Zion, the Kaf, and the Wow. Okay, so now I got the little chart right here. We got the Zion, the Kaf, right, and the Wow. Zaku. Right? And as the brother is showing you that, the Hebrew root word zaku comes from the word zaka. Zaka means to be worthy. Zaka means to be pure. This is why you find some brothers, even from one west, naming themselves zakai. Because the word zakai means purity or cleansiness. You understand? So just to let that to be noted and understood. White people are not pure and clean. And it's not to be disrespectful or sound racist. When you study their history, they're not pure. They're not clean. They're the ones who uh, promoted wickedness and dirtiness. Um, their language, there's no F word in the Hebrew. Um, you cannot curse somebody out. So their whole linguistics, not saying that I haven't used profanity, but their whole linguistics have language connotations that should never be said to your maker in a prayer. So, yeah, your, your culture is dirty. You understand? So now getting back into this portion right here, it says, um, Zaku Nizareha. The second word we read right there, Nizareha, is translated either as Nazarites or Nazir, meaning prince. So sometimes scholars say it could be prince, sometimes they could say it could be Nazarites. But let's move on. Zaku Nizareha Mishaleg. Shaleg means snow, meaning from snow or of snow. That is the purity of those people. But it's not talking about looking like Caucasian. Because as we remember, 
they are what the five percenters even call them colored. You got green eyes, you got pale skin, and it turns red when you get upset. But you call me colored? No, you're you're multicolored. You're the one who's not of the earth. You understand? So let that be noted and understood. Everything that come out the earth comes out looking like the complexion originally as me and the brother Daniela. Sugar comes out brown. You understand? Rice comes out brown. Bread comes out brown. Grain comes out brown. They bleach that. So that shows you that it's not, it's an original. All right, so let that be noted. Now, Zaku Nezareha Mishelek. Zaku. This other word, Zaku, all right, as we see the root right here being, we're going to use this side, is the Zade, right? The Ket and the Wow. So, Zade and Ket together spells the word Zak. That's the same root word that we went over in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 4. So it's not talking about them looking Laban or white. It is talking about them being Zaku or Zaka, meaning pure. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about them being bright in their character and how they was able to also move about. Then when you go furthermore in the verse, it says Admu Etzem. Mifnehem, meaning odd move from the Hebrew root word Adam, meaning man or soldier. Atzmehem, meaning their bones. They was able to stand up erect and be of a certain type of caliber. That's what that's talking about, even in its physicality. You understand? Mifnehem, sapir, meaning like a sapphire. That's what that's talking about. It is speaking about some physical attributes and in reference also to their character. So that's something to be noted. Now, if you could show me where it said that they were Laban, then we can sit there and have an argument. Because then I can sit there and say, okay, wow, that literally does mean white. Like Labana means white in reference with the moon. All right. So just to sit there and just go over those couple of Hebrew precepts to let that be noted and understood. All right. Now, next thing, if you will, I like to sit there, if you will, go to the book of Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 116. To further my point and conclude with that aspect. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16. Then we're going to move on to another subject. It reads Prophet Isaiah 1 16. And here is what it says. This is mind you as stated speaking about character. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doing from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. The Hebrew in Isaiah chapter 1 16. Right? Because we're going to sit there and show this linguistically from the Hebraic understanding. It is not talking about making yourself look like a European when it says being pure. All right? And here's what it says. The following. Rakazu hizaku hasiru ra be'alechem menegen enai kilu harea. Now, the Hebrew root word that I want to focus on is the Hebrew word hizaku. It has the hey. The Zion, the Kaf, and the Wow. He, Za, Ku. Now, for those who are following, when it said Za, Ku, and Za, Ku, the U sound at the end signifies the pluralization of the word. Okay, so if you say Kadal, meaning stop. Kitlu, meaning you're telling more than one to stop. All right? He, Za, Ku, meaning make yourselves pure. It's the same root word that's used in Lamentations chapter 4 verse 7 about them being pure. So you're not going to sit there and try to linguistically say that it's speaking about making the people looking white or European looking. <clears throat> Stop that. Racist, low budget mentality. All right. Mm -hmm. So that should be noted and understood. Now we want to touch upon another particular subject, if we will. It's not going to be too long winded in this one. It's concerning a meme that the brother is showing you about a guy they call Anthony Johnson. Now, I want to sit there and speak about that particular subject just a little bit. Because I have part of it right here. See, and as we see here, Anthony Johnson, according to some, was supposed to have been the pioneer of American slavery. But as we know good and well and understand that it is impossible for him to be the pioneer of American slavery. The definition of pioneer means one who goes into unfamiliar territory for exploration purposes and to be the first to do so. You can look that up in Random House Dictionary. You can look that up in American College Dictionary, which I did in the school that I work in. You understand? 
So there's no way that a black man named Anthony Johnson could be the pioneer of American slavery, as some attempt to state. Now, as the brother is showing you in the meme right there being presented, it says that not only was it done by a black man, he went to court and demanded it. It says this, in 1654, it was time for Anthony, meaning Anthony Johnson, to release John Kaser, a black indentured servant. Instead, Anthony told Kaser that he was extending his time. Kaser left and became employed by the free white man, Robert Parker. Anthony Johnson sued Robert Parker in the Northampton court in 1654. Remember that date. In 1655, the court ruled that Anthony Johnson could hold John Kaser indefinitely. The court gave judicial sanction for blacks to own a slave of their own race. Thus, Kaser became the first permanent slave and Anthony Johnson the first permanent slaveholder. Now, remember that date I stated 1654 and 1655, right? Please remember that date. Now, let's go collegiate, if we will. Bless be the most high. Got this book, and that's many, the cover's off, because that's how you shine it down. We're taking it on and off the shelf, okay? But this book here is called A History of the American People, written by Paul Johnson, all right? Now, some of the writings of Paul Johnson, he's so-so. He, he throws his little opinions in there. Because in his writings, he used the N-I-G-G-E-R word like it's nothing. You understand? But um, I guess that's part of his freedom of speech. Um, now, getting back into this point right here. Um, this is what we read in this particular thing here. Three weeks later, he's speaking about something with John Wolfe in 1619, right? Three weeks later, on August 20th, John Wolfe recorded in his diary the third notable event of the year. They came in a Dutchman of war that sold us 20 negros. He did not state the price, but added that 15 of the blacks were bought by Yardley himself for work on his 1,000 acre tobacco plantation and flower do 100, which is a part of Virginia. These men were unfree, though not strictly speaking, slaves. It is doubtful if any of the first batch of blacks from Africa ended up on free farmers of the colony. Some are recorded as having done so, however. What was more ominous, however, was the success with which Yardley and other landowners used blacks to work their tobacco plantations. Yardley, as we read in this book right here, entitled A History of the American People, all right, by Paul Johnson on page 27. Sir George Yardley, you can look this up on your own time, was the governor of Virginia who died in 1627. So if he died in 1627 and he had slaves that worked on his plantation in the tobacco field, how can Anthony Johnson in 1654 or 1655 be the pioneer of American slavery having black people as slaves perpetually? Now, remember that date. And when you get in your own time, because we like to do this on Maccabees TV, we're grown up for the most of us who's watching this or those who endeavor. Get your own time and reference some of the things that we care to talk about. There's a book that was made onto YouTube as well. It is called Slavery and the Making of America. And in that book, it is coming out of Horton and Horton books. The name of the book as stated is called Slavery and the Making of America. That book records that a guy, a black guy named John Punch, you can look this up, John J-O-H-N Punch, P-U-N-C-H. John Punch in the 1640s was a permanent slave inside of Virginia in the 1640s. So now if that's the case, and you can look that up in your own time, how then is this guy, how then is that guy, Anthony Johnson, the pioneer, throw it out. How is Anthony Johnson then the pioneer of American slavery? So let that be noted. He's not the pioneer of American slavery. So that's this meme is a falsehood. Also, I um got in contact with a co-worker in the school I work in about photography because he's heavy into that. And I like history. So we combined a little bit together. He's also a brother from the West Indies. He's what one West will call Benjamin because he comes from a place called Trinidad. Much respect to my friend Ronald from the school. All right, I'm going to just leave it at that. I ain't going to blow up the last name. Anyway, this guy right here, where did this picture come from? Because you got to then show who painted it on canvas or who did the photography. 
The first recorded click click with the camera was done in 1826 inside the United States, so in 1825. The first president to get that done was after his presidency named John Quincy Adams in 16, pardon me, in 1841. So how is this picture accurate? Where did this picture come from? Where did the information in this come from? And to sit there and say that he is the pioneer of American slavery, we went over John Punch, and we also went over the guy, Sir George Yardley. He was the governor of Virginia who died in 1627, who had slaves permanently. So, so let that be noted. Case closed with the Anthony Johnson. See how quick that was? See, it's not sit there. You ain't got to go through 89 reams. We're just going to sit there and drop the info for you and see what you care to do with it. Next subject, let's go for many people like the, like the Caucasian Jews who want to sit there like Rabbi Meza and others who want to sit there and shout out on the Hebrew Israelites on, on YouTube always want to talk about Deuteronomy 2868 and they don't get into the Hebrew of it. Let's go into Deuteronomy 2868. Did this on my own YouTube channel, but we want to bring this out on Maccabees TV because the people need to see it. Now, we want to sit there and justify the fact that what is referred to as non-Messianic and Messianic alike both quote this and both teach the same about the same scripture. Okay? Let's go to Deuteronomy 2868 in the English. We read, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spoke unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies, for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now sometimes they'll try to sit there before we get to the Hebrew and say, see, it says that it's talking about them and the Romans because what happened with Titus in 70 AD. If that's the case, you still got a problem because the war that Titus was part of in 70 AD was due to the war that his father Vespasian started in 66 AD. You understand? When um, Nero sent him out there to go against Jotapata, Samaria, um, and other places of the land of Israel or Israel. Titus wasn't even an emperor at the time in which he did this. Now, when you get into the history of Tacitus, he gets into what happened when he sent in the regiments of the 10th and the 12th and the 15th and the 22nd that came out of Alexandria, Egypt to go into the land of Israel. You had it to where Abraham migrated from what's called Israel to Egypt. After that, you read about Thutmose the third going from what is called Egypt to the Euphrates. You have it to where you had the Israelites that wound up going into the land of Egypt on their own volition. Jeroboam did it. Also, during that situation of when they assassinated one of the prophets named Uriah, he went into the land of Egypt and King Jehoiachin of Judah had him brought back and assassinated when you go to Jeremiah 26. You understand? So going back and forth physically by foot or camel or caravan or horse from the land of Israel to the land of Egypt was not the great feat. So far to date, no one has been able to show where Titus historically is recorded as taking people from the land of Israel to the land of Egypt by ship. You do read, however, in Josephus, where it says that he took people that were put in Egypt by ship to Rome. So that way they can sit there and have the triumph when he sat there and said he took 700 best of the sons of Israel or Israel and paraded them around the cities of Rome and other places in Italy for his triumph. So that's something things to sit there and let that be noted and understood. Now, let's get into linguistics to show how that's not the case. First off, is the verse starts with the word and. That means you got to read before that to know what it's talking about. So if that being the case, let's go, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 63. And it says this, right? And it shall come to pass that as the Most High rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Most High will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked from off the land where you go to possess it. Remember, brought to naught, then plucked off. Let's see what happens next. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there you shall serve other gods which neither thou Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their fathers, nor the Israelites in Moses' time, have known even wood and stone, Islam, Christianity of today. And among these nations, you shall find no ease. Now, if this is what people are saying, like somebody want to put on YouTube, Deuteronomy 28, verse 48 to verse 68, is talking about Israel only in the Romans. Then how do you explain verse 65, 
where it says among these nations. Ha'amim ha'ele. So you want to go into the Hebrew. Ha'amim ha'ele. These nations. I'm going to do it English and Hebrew. Blessed be the Most High. How do you explain that? You understand? Ek ata beba'er ha'milim ha'ele. How do you explain these words here? Among these nations. Plural. So you don't sit there and say it's only to my Israel and Rome. So let's move on. All right? And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning thou shalt say, What God and what even? And at even thou shalt say, What God and what morning? For the fear of thine heart which thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Then it goes on. Now let's go into the Hebrew, because we already read the English more than once. It says this, right? As the brother is showing you this particular part in the Hebrew. Thank you for that, I it says the following. We have sheep kaya mitzrayim, ba ani yo, ba derek asher amorti laka, lo tosif old liur ota, we hit makona tem sham lo oyebeka, la abadim ba least fakot ba in kone. Now let's bust down one thing in particular. The Hebrew word, the last word that you see there is kone from the root word kana, and a lot of times, like Israelites who come from one west, properly do teach. That the word Kwana also means to redeem, meaning that there will be no one to redeem you. <clears throat> the Khazar Jew who don't think that a black Israelite would sit there and get into the Hebrew tries to sit there and say, oh no, the word Kwana only means to buy. It doesn't mean to um to redeem. Go to Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 8. All right, so we can gain an understanding. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 8. And we're going to see what it says here. We read the following. I said, we have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, who were sold unto the nations for as much as we could afford. Now, when you go to Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 8, I hope the brother is able to sit there and show you that portion right there. It says, Anik Anaknu Kwaninu. Kwaninu, right, is the root word from Kwana, which means to redeem, to buy, to acquire, or to possess. So right there in the Masoretic text, the Stone Edition, as well as the King James, the root word Kwana is all translated in Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 8 as the word redeem. Anaknu Kwaninu. Anaknu is the plural, is the um, pronoun we. And then Kwaninu, the new at the end agreeing with the um, pronoun. So let's get our linguistics up in Hebrew. You understand? Um... Moving along, so we already explained the whole issue with the word Kwana and its root to also meaning of the word redeem. Now, getting back to Deuteronomy 28, verse 68 in the Hebrew, all right, says this. Where has sheep ka? His sheep is the heath ill verb stem, which means to the causative of the qual stem, all right, for edification purposes. So that's something that should be noted and understood, all right? I want to sit there and show this. All right, we're going Old Testament, old school style now. There's 201 Hebrew verbs. Of the seven verb stems, you have what is called the qual, the nif al, the pl, the po al, the hif il, the hofal, and the hipa el. We explained this before on Maccabees TV, but I want to explain it a little bit more in depth right now for edification purposes because they swear that we don't know Hebrew in explaining Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. The hif il is the fifth stem, and it is the causative of the qual stem. So that's something should be noted and understood. The qual stem is considered the first stem, which Hebrew word qual or kal, which literally means easy or light, L-I-G-H-T. You understand? So let that be noted. That is what you call the simple active. Then you got the nif al, which is the passive. We went over that before on Maccabees TV. Then you got the pl, which is the intensive of the qual. You see that in the book of Exodus chapter 33, where it says, um, Hashte Halukot Ashil Ashil Shibarata, which you shattered. When this speaks about Moshe breaking the tables of stone, the Hebrew there, when you're dealing with the vowels, says Shibarata, which means you shattered them. So the PL is the intensification of the qual. The Pu'al is the passive of the PL. The Hif'il is is the causative of the qual. And the hof'al is the passive of the hif'il. And the hipa'el is the reflexive of the more. So you got three active, three passive, and one reflexive. 
Rakats T, I was. Hit Rakats T, I was myself. So let that be noted. In Spanish, it's Yavar is to wash. Yavar to say is to wash oneself. In Hebrew, you put the reflexive in the beginning of the original root word, mit rakate, mit labesh, so forth and so on. Mit kwameim, so forth and so on. And that's how you formulate that particular formation right there. Shout out to my brother, Shama Allah from FOPE. All right. So we're going to move on with that particular thing. These are the types of things that they swear Israelites don't know how to sit there and particularly break down. Are we trying to show off? No. Are we trying our best to edify? Ken. Khan. Okay? So let that be noted. Lastly, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, the word Mizraim, the Hebrew root word Mazor, means distress. And you see that when you go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 53. The Hebrew word Mazor meaning distress. Now, brothers and sisters, this letter right here, why I got this out in the very first place, this baby right here is very important. This is called the letter Mem or Ma when you're dealing with Lashon HaKadash. Okay? The, this right here is used in many cases as a prefix in many cases as a suffix. When you're pluralizing it, this is the word that you see. When you're showing that um, it's coming from the Bakalam, that sit there and shows you that it's used as a prefix. The Hebrew word Zor means trouble or distress. So Ma'zir means distress or trouble. You understand? When you go in the book of Psalms 118 verse 5, the Most High delivered me out of my trouble and answered me with a great enlargement. The Hebrew word Ma'zir meant Zor is used there meaning trouble or distress. The Ayin shows you the pluralization doubled of the Ma'zir. So let that be noted and understood. So one of the things to let it be noted and pointed out is this. You have garab meaning sock. Garabayim, socks, because it's pluralized. Regel means foot. Raglayim means two feet or feet because you only have two feet. Shulkan is table. Shulkanayim means two tables. Nahar is river. Naharayim means two rivers. You understand? So when you're saying Mizrayim, you're saying that Matzir is double plural of whatever that root is. That root being matzir, meaning distress or trouble. So the Most High will bring you back into a double distress by Aniyot and ships. That's how you break that verse down. It had nothing to do with Titus going over into the land of Israel and then taking them from Jerusalem by foot. Because remember, Jerusalem is their land. So you got to go all the way past where the Philistines was and then put them in the ship just to take them there? No. That's not what happened. So that's something to be noted and understood. All right. So this particular subject, I just want to sit there and state a couple of things in closing this out. The word Zak, Zadam Ket, means bright, it means pure, and it means clear. The word Zaka, Zayin, Kaf, and He means pure, and it means to be worthy. When you get into this book right here, the root word Zaka, just to show you real quick. Right? This is 201 Hebrew verbs. Zaka. Right here. Literally means, as says what? To be worthy. So that's what that's talking about in Isaiah chapter 1 verse. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16. Wash you, make you pure. It's not asking you to look like a Caucasian. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 26 uses the word Labana for moon. Because the word Laban means white. The Hebrew word Zohab. Um, or Zahob, that is actually the Hebrew word Zohab or Zahob, as we saw in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verse 30, speaking about the blonde or the yellow thin hair, that's part of the plague of leprosy. And that's a delicacy among the Caucasians. So that's something to be noted from the Hebraic scriptures as far as that is concerned. When you get brothers and sisters into the matter of, like some people try to quote Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6. Where it says, and why has all faces gathered paleness? That's another mistranslation. The Hebrew word that's used there in Jeremiah 30 verse 6 is the Hebrew word yerekon. Yerekon comes from the Hebrew root word yerekon, which literally means jaundice. Jaundice is a disease that can make you look pale or yellow, or mentally can sit there and affect your thoughts to where you don't want to prosper. You can look jaundice, J-A-U-N-D-I-C-E. We deal with linguistics and we deal with etymology and we deal with books once we come with Maccabees TV. We're not just dealing, I was part of Hashaba. 
No disrespect to my teacher calling me Gael, but my teacher told me, get your books and move on. Shalom, Bane. Shalom, son. Peace and take care. So here's the point of what I'm saying. You don't sit there and say, this master teacher, and once he goes, what in the world I'm going to do? The most I said, I give you a king in my anger, take him away in my wrath. So if you want to sit there and just latch on to a man so much, and when he die, you don't know what in the world to do. And not to snap on any Israelite camp, that's what happened with the Israelites when the guy named Yulin Minchu passed away, who called himself Yahweh Ben Yahweh. When he died, Erdom can't, that congregation ain't know what in the world to do because you put your trust in man and not in Yah, the maker and creator of heaven and earth. So there's going to be more presentations concerning this issue with Maccabees TV. For the side note, yeah, that cone is also used in Deuteronomy 28, verse 22, where it says, The most I will smite you with, with mildew. Mildew is yet a cone, which also literally would mean jaundice. We already went over that in definition. So with that, just want to sit there and say, giving honor and praise to Yah, the creator and maker of heaven and earth on a human level. My brothers from AOC, my brother Hashar, my brother Nasi Yashuvel, my brother that's here, the brother Priest Daniela from the Lions of Israel, um, my brother Divine Prospect, um, my younger sister Shantice, who actually helped me edit this, I asked her because she's not really in this real life, so I know I'm going to get a very unbiased opinion. She has a degree once it comes down to some kind of linguistics, and she, no offense intended, eats unclean. So I'm going to ask her because she's going to give me a raw account. She's not going to sit there and say, oh, I'm going to hurt the Israelites' feelings, so I'm going to curve it. No, she's going to be raw with that. So I like and give her much honor and respect. Also, giving a shout-out to... The brothers from the Mishpaka Drummers. Also giving a shout out to um, a sister and a very good friend of mine, Milka Bat Yehuda, that um, her and I correspond online and she gives me advice on presentations and so forth and so on. So with that, I say Shalom, Ubraka, Wet Ahaba, Shalom, Lahitra, Ot, Lepapam, Asha, Anachu, Nif, Gosh. Shalom, Makeh.